Sadia. It, it's such a pleasure the way you host us. We appreciate it so much. And I'm going to pass the baton right on to Jean Munz. Okay. Hi, everyone. Glad to see you on this snowy, blowy evening. Aren't we glad we didn't have to drive anywhere, for heaven's sake? Tonight's presentation with Lydia Scott, uh, The Oak Recovery Project, is part of the series we at Start in Your Yard in conjunction with the Gail Borden Public Library are calling Over Our Heads. The previous pre presentation, like Sadia said, and all of last year's series are available if you go to our website, startinyouryard.com. We think you'll notice other interesting things as you scroll through this website and there, and it will show you some of our upcoming events, but I'm gonna turn this to Nancy who might wanna say a few things about that. I'm just gonna say one thing, whether you're looking for inspiration, information, instruction, insight, or intentional planting plans, make startnearyard.com your first stop. There's a lot of goodies out there, plus what's current. So get acquainted with it so you can recommend it to friends and neighbors if you would. So Start in Your Yard is an initiative that was started by the Wild Ones Greater Kane County Chapter. Uh, and it exists to assist homeowners as Nancy was uh, just saying. I'm gonna turn to our Wild Ones Chapter President, Kim Haig who will mention more about some upcoming Wild Ones programs and introduce this evening's speaker, Kim. Well, thank you. As, I, as she said, I'm Kim Haig, uh, president of our local chapter. And uh, just so you know, too, we also we have the startinyouryard.com or Start in Your Yard, but we also have uh, two separate Facebook pages now. We have the Facebook page for Wild Ones of Greater Kane County, and we have our sister Facebook page for Start in Your Yard. And some of the things will be the same, but Start in Your Yard uh, is an initiative of Greater Kane County Wild Ones, and it has specifically intended to help you with really practical ways to start in your yard with nature. <laughs> Plants. And that's exactly what it does. It's just, it's been a, such a thrill to see it grow and prosper. So please visit both the um, Facebook pages if you're on Facebook. Um, next week, Wild Ones, are, we're presenting another program on Thursday night. It's with uh, Benjamin Vogt, and he is a, a native plant landscaper from Eastern Nebraska. He's also a PhD in creative writing, and he's just, he's going to be talking about um, gardening in layers and all obviously all native plants so please tune in it's on the, the facebook page and um, on our web page too how to sign up for free on zoom again so thanks for that um, just so you know our public sale we're going to have a real public sale of native plants this year it's going to be on may 14th and it's going to be at gray willows farm in campton hills so uh, there's going to be information forthcoming on that. And so we're so excited. This will be our 10th sale. Um, and this will be a, one in person. We're hoping. We're hoping nothing <laughs> gets in the way of that. The other thing you want might want to think about is that we and a, a number of other organizations in Kane County are starting, have started a, the Spring Ephemeral Project. There's a lot of information on the Facebook page and on our website. Uh, 10 of us are doing it, so you can go out into the various uh, nature areas in Kane County from March 1st to May 31st. Use your iNaturalist app. If you go on there, there's information on how to uh, access it on our Facebook page, Facebook page, Wild Ones Facebook page. Yes, and um, you can record all the spring ephemerals that are coming up. So it's a really exciting thing. St. Charles Park District did it last year and they approached us and then we approached a whole bunch of other place organizations like the Forest Preserve and Trout Park and things like that so that they can work on that too. So it's a really fun project. I hope you all participate and we'll have more information forthcoming on that. But now I would like to introduce um, Lydia Scott. We're so pleased to have her. She is the director of the Chicago Region Tree Initiative. And this program was started in 2014 with collaboration between Morton Arboretum and Open Lands, and they now have 100 partners. It focuses on forest composition, stewardship, increased forestry, professionalism, 
equity, and climate change in order to improve the health and diversity of the canopy over the regional urban forest. Its goal is to inspire people to value trees, improve the region's canopy, reduce threats to trees, and enhance the oak ecosystems. They have a master plan 2050, which took three years to develop. It was started in 2019. And the plan states that by 2050, the Chicago region will be the most livable, most resilient region in America. So Lydia herself has um, been with the Morton Arboretum since 2011. She started as the manager of the Community Trees Program and became the director of the Chicago Region Tree Initiative in 2014. She has a master in environmental sciences and natural resources from the University of Illinois and has had a lot of service in the whole natural region, natural, natural restoration in the region, sorry. Um, I was pleased to have, to see Lydia present it um, with the Forest Preserve of Kane County at Brewster Creek last year. She presented with two other people, one talking about herbiciding, one talking about options for your native landscaping. And it was so very interesting. So I am so thrilled that she's going to be with us tonight. So thank you, Lydia. Thank you for having me. Um, all right, so thank you everyone. I, I'm hoping that you're in a nice, warm, comfortable place and out of the cold tonight. I was watching the bunnies and the squirrels run across my yard today and thinking I'm grateful I'm not an animal today. So I am I'm grateful for my warm space. We're gonna talk tonight, um, as, as has been said, about the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan and really how it impacts you and how you can be actively involved in improving the health of our oak ecosystems because they're our natural heritage. Um, in the Chicago Region Trees Initiative, as was mentioned, uh, we have a master plan and we have four key goals. And one of those goals is to enhance oak ecosystems. And so it's a pretty significant issue for us when you think about their wide range of issues and concerns that we have across the Chicago region. This is one of four that we felt like was really a priority for us. And so I'm gonna focus on that tonight. Um, as I mentioned, our oak ecosystems are our natural heritage. I understand you've heard from Doug Ptolemy and all of his wonderful work about why oaks are significant to us. And also from Ed Collins, who's another expert in oaks. Um, interestingly enough, the Arboretum has done uh, research on the oaks across the US. And there's only one state in the entire continental US that does not have a native oak and that's Idaho, which is where I'm from. So I feel very sad about that, but that's, uh, I, I was very surprised that that's the case. So Eric, oaks really are um, endemic to our country and we, we're gonna find out why they're so specifically important to our region. So for those of you that heard Doug Ptolemy before, you know very well that oaks support a wide range of animals and plants. They have symbiotic relationships with many living things. And because they are sort of the keystone species, the main species that these wildlife and animals and plants and fungi rely on, it's really a critical species to keep within an ecosystem. And so that's why we refer to it as the oak ecosystem. It might include hickories, it might include American elm, it might include cherries and other species, but it's an oak ecosystem because that is the primary species that these species thrive and revolve around. So for instance, when you look at the maps of the US and these are soil maps, we are in the Eastern Temperate Forest Range and we have very specific conditions here in Chicago and the Chicago area that have resulted in a very specific oak ecosystem for us. Oftentimes you'll hear from uh, ecologists that they only collect acorns or plant trees that come within about 150 mile radius of where we live. And the objective there is to keep those same species and same derivations of those species in this area because they are unique to this area and it's for a wide range of reasons. So for instance, they often refer to our region as being formed by fire and ice, the ice being the glaciers that covered our landscape and created the surface that we have, that we experience here in Illinois with it being, you know, especially in our area, very flat. But we also know that from fires that the fire comes about because of how the landscape was made, uh, managed uh, by the, the original Native American Indians who lived here in, the, in uh, this area before well before the European settlers got here. So as, as far back as 10,000 years ago, Native Americans were managing the landscape with fire and they used fire because it cleaned the landscape very easily. It helped drive wildlife to a location where they were easier to hunt. It helped clear the landscape so that they could do agriculture. 
And as it traveled across the United States, or I mean, traveled across our area of Illinois, it traveled very quickly because of our flat landscape. But what happened is when it came to those river corridors that we have within our region that run typically north south, the trees on the east side of those rivers remained while the trees on the west side of the rivers did not. And that was due to the frequency of the burning. And so where you see in this, this map that is shown in the image on the right hand side of the screen, that green area, those are where the trees were located. And so you can see for Illinois being a prairie state, then in our area, the seven county metro area, there were a lot of areas that were very predominantly oak ecosystems or oak forests at that time. And so, and we have records of this and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, how it, how it uh, came about. So we know that fire and the glaciation played a very significant role in where we see our trees and our landscape. So fire influenced vegetation, vegetation patterns, mainly because um, our, native, our native plants have deep root systems. And so when a fire comes across and singes the tops of those plants, it doesn't kill them. Uh, the root systems are very deep and very intact. And so as a consequence, when fire comes across those plants, it, it reinvigorates them so that the next time they come up, they come up thicker and healthier than they did before. And that's part of this evolutionary process between the fire and the plants that we have here. For our trees, that our trees have thick corky bark on them, our oaks, and some of our hickories as well do well with fire. So that those, when we get, you know, you run a fire through, for instance, um, small maple saplings and things like that die fairly quickly because they have a very thin bark and don't respond well to fire. But because our landscape was managed by fire, that's the dominant species that we see are our oaks today. So this is an image, there are two maps here. One, the very left uh, map is, our, is a map of the oaks and this is prior to European settlement. This is in the 1800s. And then we have non-oaks, uh, non which is the little map in the middle there. So you can see that oaks were really the predominant tree species in our region. And, that's, uh, and we use that information in order to form how we manage our landscapes today. So how do we know what trees were here in prior to European settlement? Well, in the 1830s, the US government hired surveyors that walked across the United States and recorded different things that they saw as they went mapping the US to get it ready to sell to settlers. And so these surveyors walked across the United States and recorded the different things that they passed. And this is an illustration of, from one of the, the diaries of the surveyors that show some of the things that they recorded. So they draw where the rivers were crossing, they draw uh, and, and identify where there might be barrens, where there might be prairies, where there might be woodlands. And at each of the little uh, lines that they walked along, they also identified the size and the species of trees that they passed. And so someone at the Arboretum, a gentleman by the name of Marlon Bowles, took those survey notes and recorded all of those trees and put them on a map so that we could see them today. And then we could layer them against other maps that we have. So this shows you the mapping that went on with the surveyors. And essentially, it's the six mile by six mile, which are the townships that we currently live in today. And so each of those six mile segments had, uh, was mapped and had different data recorded on each of those, um, those different areas where they crossed. And so you can see here on the upper right hand side of my slide that there are little tiny green dots located on this grid system. Those are the trees that were recorded as they walked along those different uh, vertical and horizontal lines. Uh, in surveying the US. And then the image on the left is just an illustration of what their, an image of what their diary or their surveyor notes looked like. They referred to the trees that they crossed and that they mapped along these lines as witness trees or bearing trees. And those were the trees that, that uh, identified exactly where they were passing through. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and we uh, have a, a partner at the Field Museum, that developed a map for us that has those witness trees mapped today on a, an app that you can go to. And I provided the link to that uh, app so that if any of you are interested, you can go on your phone, log into this. And then if you're walking through the forest preserve or down a road where you see a really big oak tree along the side of the road, you could look to see if there was a tree here and if it was that species and prior to European settlement. And you may actually find a bearing tree or a witness tree that is still here today. And we have a number of them that have been tracked um, and that have, people have let us know about. So it's fun to see. So feel free to explore that, that app on your phone. 
So this is what the map looks like. And you can see again where we have our oaks, which are the brown, uh, the brown dots and the red, which are the non-oaks uh, in the seven county Chicago metro area. And this is a map of the bearing trees that were written down in those surveyor notes uh, in the 1800s. We took those surveyor notes and the mapping, and we, as I mentioned, those have been mapped by a gentleman from the Arboretum. And they, we took the 1930 aerial photo photographs, and we also took the 2010 photographs, and we overlaid those. So now we can see what was here pre-settlement, what was here in the 1939, and what was here in 2010. And the reason that it's important that we have the 1939 images in there is because between 1800s and 2010, you can get new trees that will have come up that will look like they were original trees prior to European settlement, but they're really not. So you need a middle age uh, map in order to identify those. And so when we look at this map, you can see the yellow areas are what were trees prior to European settlement. And the areas that are drawn in red are the areas that were here in the 1939. And then the areas that now are in bright yellow that are surrounded by red are the oaks that exist today. So I'm gonna back up just so you can see that again. So the yellow area here are all the oaks that were located prior to European settlement. And the yellow areas here is what's left today. So you can see there's a pretty significant decline in the, the uh, composition of our oak ecosystems uh, just based on this one image um, that you can see. And you can see as, as this neighborhoods have developed, you can see roads go through, you can see cul-de-sacs. And those are areas where trees have been removed and have um, now been replaced with buildings, roads, and other, uh, other things. So in the 1830s, prior to European settlement, at that time, there were about a million acres of oak ecosystems in our area, which seems hard to imagine again, because we think of this, as I said before, as the prairie state, but we did have a lot of forests and woodlands here prior to European settlement. So I want you to notice on this map how, uh, those brown blobs that are on the map are where the forests were located. How they're fairly significant, but when you look at this map, this is the 1930s. Look how those, those brown areas have now become little pinpricks or little tiny dots on the map. I'm gonna back up again so you can see. That's how dense the oak ecosystems were prior to European settlement. And this is in 1939. And in 1939 of those million acres, we only had 280,000 acres left. This is what it looks like now and well or look like in 2010 we have 173,000 acres of oak ecosystems left and again you can see there are little tiny dots on the the map why that's important to note is that oaks function as ecosystems and they function much better and are much healthier when they're functioning together in intact units rather than little individual trees spread across the landscape and we're going to talk a little bit more about why that's important to know and again, here's a map showing you the prior to European settlement on the right-hand side and then oak ecosystems today. So what's happening to our oaks? Well, um, one of the things that we know is fragmentation, which we just already talked about with the mapping. So we know that these intact forest units have been broken up with homes and roads and buildings and other uh, surfaces or golf courses, parks, other things like that where those trees have been removed. When we look back in 1939 and, and what was here in 2010, um, we can see that we have significant size reductions. So right now there are no 1,000 acres of woodlands anywhere um, in the seven county Chicago metro area that are an intact unit. We have a few that are 500 to 1,000 acres and then on down we get a few more as they get smaller. But you can see those intact units have been sold off or broken up. The other challenge that we see is that because the landscape was made, uh, managed by fire by the Native Americans, uh, it was suppressed for a long time. And as a consequence, some of those areas that were historic oak ecosystems or ecosystems that had evolved with use of fire or management of fire have been now converted or changed to maple and basswood forests. Maple and basswoods do not handle fire very well, and they're also able to grow very densely in very dark uh, conditions. So where oaks need lots of light, maples do not. And as a consequence, they can outcompete our oaks and begin to fill in in spaces where um, oaks do not uh, thrive as well. So we can see, and as you'll go through some of the forest preserves that you visit, you'll notice entire forest preserves that are all maples now, and that's a conversion that's taken place since pre-settlement times. 
The other thing that's impacting our native oak ecosystems are invasive plants. And that's not just uh, woody plants. Now the ones on the, the right there are woody plants that are identified, but we have things like garlic mustard and um, other many other uh, invasive species, teasel and things like that, that are very impactful to our native ecosystems. But buckthorn, European buckthorn is by far the worst of all the ones that we have. Um, honeysuckle is, is a close second. 36% of all of the trees in the Chicago region are European buckthorn. And if you live in Lake County, it's 52% of all the trees in Lake County are buckthorn. In King County, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it, it isn't nearly as bad as it is in Lake County. Um, honeysuckle used to be 3% in 2010, it's now 6% of all the trees. And then you have some of the smaller ones like multiflora rose, bittersweet, garlic mustard is shown on here, Japanese barberry. And one that's becoming even more problematic is Bradford pear or calorie pear. This is a species that was in active cultivation and is still actually sold in nurseries today. And when you look across the landscape in the spring and you see little white blossoms on trees out in the natural areas, that most likely is Bradford pear that's invading those areas. Another challenge that we see with our oaks, as I mentioned before, is that they need sunlight. When you walk through your, your forest preserves or a natural area in the spring, you may see a bunch of little tiny oaks that are starting to pop up out of the ground and have their leaves on them. But when you come back in the next year or two years, you won't find them in the landscape. And the issue with that is a couple of things. One, that they're being browsed by deer, which tend to be overpopulated in our area. There's no native predator for deer that, uh, other than humans or cars right now that keeps deer populations in check. Uh, but it's also lack of light. Our oaks need 30 to 50% full sun in order to be able to thrive and grow. They need that much sunlight to produce the energy that their root systems and their structures need to be able to grow and thrive. So oftentimes you'll see a current practice that's taking place in some of the forest preserves right now is creating what they call canopy gaps. And we got some of that with the loss of many of our ash trees where they died and now you get sunlight in, so you're starting to get some of these other species in. But the forest preserves are actually actively managing to, to create light gaps or openings in the canopy so that we can get age diversity in our forest. And age diversity is really important. We know from the 2010 census that the Morton Arboretum conducted that about uh, the majority of our oaks in the region are 18 inches or larger in diameter. We're not seeing them in the smaller size classes. And in order to have oaks for the next generation, you need to have new oaks coming up so they can replace the ones that are declining and dying and falling out of the landscape. So we need to have a broad species or broad uh, age diversity in our forests in order for them to be healthy. And in order to do that, we often have to create these canopy gaps so that we can give new trees a chance to start. Another thing that's important to think about are some of the diseases and pests that we're experiencing. So for instance, gypsy moth is an insect that was brought into the US in an attempt to increase silk production, and it was accidentally released into the wild. And as a consequence, now we struggle with that every year. The image on your right is a, a tree that's been infested by gypsy moths. They tend not to kill the tree, at least not at first, but it suppresses the amount of leaf surface area enough that the tree can't get enough nutrition so that it begins to struggle and is under stress. And when trees are under stress, they often succumb to other things. And uh, so that can sometimes be a problematic situation for oaks uh, with gypsy moth. The image on your left is bur oak blight. And we're seeing a lot of challenges with oaks right now. Some of them are climate related, where we actually have these long, wet springs where our, the, uh, the, uh, sorry, the root systems on our oaks are underwater for longer periods of time and it creates some of these root diseases that will eventually kill the tree. Some of them are being identified as sudden oak death and some of those other things that you're hearing. So uh, it's important to keep track of what's happening in your landscape, especially if you're a homeowner and where you can manage those kinds of situations to reduce those impacts to oaks. So again, why does it matter? Why do we care about our native oaks? Well, you know, as I mentioned before, they're our natural heritage. When you think about the things that we have to, uh, to think back on and to really appreciate that have been going on here in the Chicago region since before we arrived here, our oak ecosystems are one of those few things. 
The other thing that's important, and this goes back to what you learned from Doug Ptolemy, is that we have a lot of wildlife and other uh, insects and mycorrhizae fungi and other things that are relying on oaks, again, for their symbiotic relationships. We are lucky to be here in the middle of the Mississippi Flyway, where we have a lot of migrating birds flying over our area. And the thing that's cool about that is those birds know to look for the oaks because the oaks have the insects that they need to, to get the protein and the fats that they need to be able to continue on on their migration. And so we need to be very careful to support those, um, those native species that rely on our oaks. And this talks a little bit more about that. The other thing is, is that we have co-evolved with trees and, and um, green spaces in our, in our, as human beings. Uh, we've been shown, studies have been done at the University of Illinois and other institutions to show that people have these positive uh, experiences when they're around trees. So for instance, if you're in the hospital and you can see a tree out your window, you recuperate faster. If you're a child that gets an opportunity to be around uh, trees, you'll actually perform better on tests. They've shown that there is less depression, less stress or cortisols in your brain if you're exposed to and being able to be around trees. Now, obviously you could be around any number of trees, but what's more magnificent and more comforting than to be around some of these majestic oaks that we have in our area. So they do provide health benefits to us, both physical and emotional. So as was mentioned earlier, we uh, the Arboretum with Lake County Forest Preserve in Chicago Wilderness developed a strategy called the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan. And it's what, uh, what drove the impetus to get some of these oaks mapped and to begin to study some of the challenges that we're experiencing with our oak ecosystems. And there's a lot of research that's going on uh, across the region as well as across the state on oak health and what's contributing to some of the decline in our oak ecosystems. But we know they're not regenerating, and so we have to take a more active and aggressive role as land managers in order to support their improved function and growth in the landscape. And the Oak Ecosystem Recovery Plan lays out some specific strategies. It identifies many of the specific problems around uh, oak jet regeneration that I've talked to you about tonight. But I'd encourage you to go to our website at chicagorti.org and just put in Oak Ecosystem and it'll give you the plan and you can read through the entire plan and see if there are some things that you would like to do. And we're gonna talk about some of them uh, before we finish tonight, that you as a landowner and manager or even just a volunteer with the forest preserves or natural areas or in your neighborhood can have an active role to help improve um, our oaks so that we have oaks for our, our future generations. So where are the best opportunities to buffer, expand, and reconnect our remaining oak, oak remnants? So um, as I mentioned before, we've done some of the mapping and we've, we've identified where these uh, historic remnant oak ecosystems are. But what's important to understand is that oak ecosystems function much better at larger scales. And that's true of any ecosystem really. If you have these little tiny individual segments, they're often more easily and more susceptible to imp external impacts because there's what they call a perimeter to um, area ratio. And you wanna keep a larger complex that has a, as a smaller perimeter to core ratio than, uh, than a smaller site does because you have fewer impacts that can devastate that ecosystem. There are also a number of different species that rely on larger ecosystems to be able to thrive and survive. And so we need to get some of them functioning as units where we may have 15, 20 different people that own a piece of this core buffer or corridor area. If we all get them managing and, and thinking about oak ecosystem health collectively, they can be managed as a unit, even though we're all doing our own thing. So the other aspect of this image is to show you this desire or need to create connectivity between those core and buffer areas so that we have opportunities for wildlife to migrate, as well as for plants and other things to migrate uh, between those, those units so that we have good um, heritage and good uh, health of those systems. So this is a map, the brown area shows you where we have present day oak ecosystems. The green on the map shows you where we have forest preserves are larger landowners, and those are typically publicly owned and they're protected um, ecosystems. So you can see a lot, or probably most of the oaks that you see are those brown sections on there are scattered in areas outside of those green areas. Where you see those really dense concentrations is where we do have those protected areas. And again, that's another issue that we need to be thinking about 
even across multiple homeowners, if we have policies and practices in place that protect those historic oak ecosystems, then they're able to function more as units. So let's look here. The orange that I show you is, is a, a priority core area with remnant oak ecosystems. And so that's an important area that we want to keep track of. And another one is our satellite oak ecosystems. And those are a little smaller in size so that they're gonna be a little tougher to manage and to get good ecosystem health on, but they're important remnant areas that we need to protect. And what we've done is we've put buffers around them. We put a thousand foot wide buffer around the core areas and 500 foot buffers around the satellites. And again, remember this is cre in creating or increasing the effective size. So I'm gonna back it up so you can see. So without those buffers on there, they're relatively small, but when you add those buffers in, you get a much more expanded surface area or um, functional area of this ecosystem so that it's less likely to be as devastated, devastated or to be uh, experiencing external uh, impacts. And then the blue lines that are shown here are uh, opportunities to connect these ecosystems so that they can function together more as units. Now, what's important to know about with that is that often in those areas, including the blue areas and the yellow areas and in the orange areas, those are privately owned lands. So we know that 70% of all the oak ecosystems in our region are in private ownership, meaning that they're not protected. They're controlled by individual property owners who either manage them or don't manage them uh, or can bulldoze them down and put in a shopping mall or something else. Um, so it's important that we think about how we manage those landscapes so they can function correctly and how do we reach those landowners that are living within these buffer areas and these corridors or may actually have remnant oak ecosystems so they can support the health of those ecosystems for the long term. We ask each of the seven county Chicago forest preserves to identify one priority area that they would be interested in focusing on and beginning to do resident engagement to expand, expand that effective size of their site. And so each of the forest preserves has selected a location that's identified on this circle. And they're actively working to educate and engage private landowners that live around those properties in order to be able to improve the health of those oak ecosystems. Um, as a collective group, the oak ecosystem recovery uh, uh, plan implementation, we have a work group that meets a couple of times a year and they meet as, as public landowners, private landowners, and as um, land trusts and other non-for-profit organizations or anybody that wants to participate. It could be Audubon or um, anybody like that. And they work together to identify some things that would be helpful for people to have and to use in order to more effectively manage oak ecosystems and understand their importance in the landscape. So the piece that's on the left is called best management practices. And this is really a guide for a larger landowner. It's available online and you can go step by step through, you know, how do you identify if you have an oak ecosystem? How do you identify what species are on your site? What kind of conditions are there? Are you experiencing wet areas, dry areas? Where are your trees located? Where is a prairie located? It walks you through that process so that you can begin to map out what you have on your property and identify some strategies to improve the health of that ecosystem. The, the information on the right is just simply to bring to attention the general public that oaks need our help that they are not regenerating, that they're struggling, and sends them to resources at our website that they can get more information so that they can uh, begin to make an impact on oak health. One of the things that we learned from the Forest Preserve District and the partners at these meetings was that many people do not understand natural areas management. They think that when they drive by a forest preserve and you see all these trees being cut down, that somebody's doing something bad when in fact they're going through and they're cutting out invasive buckthorn. So not all that is green is good. And we try to reinforce that in some of these research resources that we provide. They also become concerned when they see fire being used in the landscape. So these, this guide in particular talks about what a healthy habitat is and some of the tools and techniques that are used to manage it so that people understand why those tools and techniques are used and how they can have impacts on, on the health of those ecosystems. As I mentioned before, buckthorn is 45%, I'm sorry, invasive woody species are 45% of all the trees that we have in the Chicago region. 
that is an issue that we've gotten very clear direction from our various partners. We need help because homeowners, as I mentioned, think that if it's green, it's good, or that it's creating a screen between my house and my neighbors. So that's important. We want to keep it there. So we've developed some tools with all of our partners that have identified what some good replacement species are to be able to utilize in your home landscape. So if you can go through and remove buckthorn, what should you be replacing it with? Or if you have a hedge and you don't want to lose it all at once because you want some screening there, that you go through, you cut out the female buckthorn first and replant that with something else and then go back in to take out the male buckthorn as things start to fill in so you're not losing your screen all at one time. We've developed this as a poster size piece that could be displayed in a green growers uh, or garden centers. And it's also as a hand sized piece that you can take with you to your nursery sales. Um, and, and we have copies of all of these uh, pieces that I'm talking about that we would be glad to share with you if you need hard copies or they're all available online through our website. Another tool that we have that we think is quite important is our interactive canopy map. And so if you go and I've provided the link here so you can play around with this uh, later on. If you go to this interactive map and you click on it anywhere you want, uh, and I clicked on it at, in St. Charles, it'll give you an image like this that comes up and it shows you what the canopy cover is for St. Charles, it's 28%. The average for the region right now is 23%. It shows that 28% of St. Charles is impervious surface and that's an indicator of heat, flooding and air quality issues. And then we have the annual benefits that the trees with that canopy within St. Charles provides over a million dollars worth of benefits every year and $7 million worth of carbon storage. If you click on the more information button, it'll take you to a canopy summary packet that explains all about St. Charles's urban forest. And again, this is available for each of the 284 municipalities in each of the 50 Chicago wards um, in, the, in the Chicago region. And this, this packet is about, it depends on the community. Some of them are longer than others based on the information that we have, but they're typically about 11 to 14 pages in length. And so they're very meaty information. But one of the things that we have included in there is a map of the historic oak ecosystems within your community so that you can see what areas in your community could really do with some help. So for instance, in this map, the darker the gray, the darker gray, I think my cursor will work, hopefully you can see it, is where the pre-settlement oaks existed. The green is where oaks existed in 1939, and the dark blue is where oaks exist today. So all that's left of the oak ecosystems that were here prior to European settlement are these darker blue areas. And so you can see that we've got some opportunities for connectivity in St. Charles along the river corridor. You've got opportunities in people's backyards, in downtowns, in other areas to incorporate oaks and other native species into your landscape so that you can support and help these areas thrive and, and, uh, and survive again. It also is an indication to you and your community where are areas in your community where you need to really focus on policies that will protect what is left of these oak ecosystems. Another guide that was developed is our Healthy Home Landscape Guide. And this was developed to help the folks that are doing conservation at home in each of the seven counties. And some, I think for in King County, um, you're with the Conservation Foundation. So it's a piece that's available through them. We also have copies you're welcome to have if you would like. And it talks about how we actively and, and carefully care for our trees in order to help them grow to be stronger and healthier. How do we limit the amount of lawn mowed turf that we have in our landscape and, and reduce the amount of pesticides and herbicides that we have? Um, how do we create uh, areas for rain gardens? And rain gardens don't have to be herbaceous plants. They can be trees and shrubs as well, especially if you're interested in low maintenance areas that can help uh, clean the water and help absorb the water that falls onto your landscape. And then how do you also uh, address these invasive species? And it gives you some information on some of the basic invasive species. So what can you do? Um, based, you know, you can obviously go to the website and get all kinds of information, but you need to be thinking about what are your capacities and your skill sets. If you're a property owner, one of the most important things you can do if you have room is to plant oaks on your property. 
and to think about those companion species that go along with oaks. And if you don't have room for oaks, then certainly focus on those native companion species that help support oak ecosystems. So while you may not have an oak on your property, you do have something that's helping support the wildlife that may live and thrive on those, those oaks. The other thing that you can think about doing is volunteering as a steward for your local natural area. There is a never ending list of projects and activities that need to take place in our natural areas that need your help and assistance. And it's a great activity to do with friends and neighbors, especially during this pandemic where everybody's interested in being outside and seeing each other without at risk of being exposed to the virus. The other thing to do, and we talked a little bit about this in a previous slide, was look at your community ordinances and regulations to see what policies are in effect to preserve and protect native oak ecosystems in your community. Most municipalities do not have any kind of uh, policy around protecting native land. Um, uh, they may have some restrictions on how development may take place, but it, I, we get calls almost every week from uh, groups or individuals within communities that want us to come do something to stop their municipality from cutting down a grove of trees to put in a, a new apartment complex or what was the latest one? I think it was an expansion of a parking lot. Um, at that point, when you've gotten to that stage, there's not a lot that you or even we can do about it. And we encourage you to look at what your existing ordinances and regulations are, because if they're not strong, you're not going to have strong protection of some of these things that you're going to want to have in your community or the preservation of what we have of our natural heritage. So you need to think about how you can advocate, advocate, advocate for trees and natural areas and oak ecosystems in your community, with your park district and within your county. And then how can you engage others to help? And obviously you guys are an definitive group, right? Because you're already drinking the Kool-Aid, you understand what these issues are and you're already thinking collectively uh, because you participate in this effort. But it's great if you can help share that message with some who may not have that same experience or knowledge. Another thing that's really an opportunity for you to think about that you can do to help is to focus on October, which uh, we got Governor Rauner when he was governor here to dedicate October as Oak Awareness Month and it continues to this day. So October is an opportunity to celebrate Oaks and to provide opportunities for your friends and neighbors to also learn about the importance of Oaks. It may be that you host a, a party at your house or that you sponsor a program at your local community, or that you encourage people to walk through the neighborhood and just identify the different species of trees and especially identify oaks in your neighborhood. Um, we host and post on our website, October events. So if you have anything that you would like to be promoted and invite other people to come to, send it along to us and we'll be glad to post it to our website so it can be shared with others. So I think, you know, kind of covered most of the key points that I wanted to cover tonight. I think though, what I really want to bring home again is that oaks are our natural heritage. That unless you live in Idaho, like where I'm from, oaks are, are part of where you live. They're part of every state in the US with the exception of Idaho. And we need to be supporting and, and uh, helping to encourage the growth and health of these natural ecosystems so that they can support the wildlife and our natural heritage for the future. I've provided my email and phone number if anybody would like to uh, chat with me about anything that I've said tonight or if there's something that I've missed that you'd like to learn more about, I'd be glad to take questions um, now if, that's, if there's still time for that. Yep. There we go. Oh, <laughs> well, you know, I. If anyone has any questions, I, I don't have any in the Q&A, but um, if anybody would like to answer ask any questions, I think now would be the good time. I, I, I will, if someone's thinking of a question, I just have to say, I, um, I was at a Conservation Foundation meeting and we are very involved with them, as you mentioned. Um, and uh, Zach Wirtz was presenting, who's part of the Chicago Region Tree Initiative okay. as well. And he, uh, Ben Haberther happened to be there, who is the uh, D Director of Natural Resources for Kane County. And I have to say that Kane County of the, of the Chicago Wilderness Counties actually has a, a fewer number or fewer number of buckthorn and honeysuckle. Yes. And I think it's due to our wonderful Natural Resources Department and all the many volunteers that go out and just what 
whack them down like me. <laughs> so, so, but I was happy to hear that, that we aren't quite as, of course, we do have a lot of farmland too. So <laughs> there's that. So, okay, there's, go ahead. Um, Jean, do you want to, okay. Well, I, yeah, uh, a question comes to me as someone who's, you know, looking at these things and how to organize people in the community and um, encourage. Uh, and I'm just wondering, Lydia, if you're aware of, uh, some of the municipalities doing unique things that we could uh, copy in some way, um, you know, as far as getting the word out to people. Um, we're working very hard on how to communicate in our community, uh, but I'm just wondering if you've heard of some unique ideas other communities are doing. Well, um, I, I can't think of anything really tremendously unique off the top of my head that, that I've heard. I know some communities will have pretty significant policies that will outline that uh, certain species of trees are to be protected and, and certain uh, densities of trees are to be protected so that it puts into play development practices so that when a project, say a landowner has a large piece that they wanna sell off or something, it requires whoever that purchaser is or whoever the developer is to meet some minimum standards. And it would be that, you know, that they have to keep certain percentages of landscape intact. They have to preserve and protect oak ecosystems. They may have to shift drainage not to impact a natural area. There's certain densities that would be allowed and not allowed. And those are really important, especially when you're thinking about how those oak ecosystems, if they're an intact unit, can be preserved and protected. And I think of one example um, in the community that I live in where a developer came in to develop a 62 acre site and had planned to put, I think it was 72 houses on it. And um, the village worked with them and worked with them to get the density down and ended up getting them to donate, I think it was 36 of those acres as uh, to add to a nature preserve that was adjoining to that. And then we worked with them to get funding for them through the Environmental Protection Agency to create open drainage swales, bioswales that were all naturalized and all of their open areas were all naturalized with native species in order to support the connectivity to an Illinois nature preserve. So they had some key things in place that enabled them to take actions that, that they uh, were able to enforce because they did have them in place. When you have um, no policies like that and a developer comes in, you really have no recourse to keep them from cutting the trees down or doing whatever they want because there's nothing legally to restrain them from doing that. And people get angry with us at our office because we don't come out to their meetings and argue with their elected officials about it when the reality is, is it something that needs to take place well in advance of that project coming up for development. Thank you. Um, I also had another question. Our, our town, our... Nope, oh, she's gone. <laughs> well, she's gone. There, is, uh, there are some questions in the uh, uh, Q&A. Were you gonna uh, uh, pose those, Kim, or were yeah. you? Yeah, one person says she's, she put in five oaks last year and she was wondering what good companion plant she would suggest. So there's some, some wonderful guides on that. Uh, one, uh, the, uh, the plants of the Chicago region, I think it has a new name out now, lists all the, if you, and you can get, you can check it out at the, the uh, Arboretum Library, or you can look at it there if you want to come in. Um, but there will be a list of species that you could get to, to go, that it'll show you what the, the oak is. So it's a white oak, a red oak, a burr oak, black oak, whatever it is, it'll show you on the bottom of that page, all of the species that you would find typically growing with that tree. And then you could go through and select what you would like. It may be hard sometimes to find the species, especially through current vendors. I heard you guys are having a native plant sale. So you'll probably have access to some of those that will be um, desirable for, for oaks. But almost any of our native uh, plants will work fine as long as you get, you know, if, if you're going to plant them under an oak, especially if it's a small oak, you'll have sun for a little while, but eventually you'll get some shade. So you need to plan that you're going to have some, some turnover in that. If it's a large oak, you want to be careful that you're not damaging the root systems around the oaks because oaks roots are very sensitive. 
Um, so you don't want to be digging up all of the turf around your oaks um, in order to put in a bunch of companion plants. You might put in some that are a little further out and let them migrate in on their own over time. Um, and those could be you know, a wide range of, of, of herbaceous as well as um, uh, shrubs and things like that that you could plant. Sedges are also a wonderful uh, opportunity for, for replacements. Yeah. And if you don't have access to plants of the Chicago region, if you'll let me know, I have a copy and I'd be glad to loan it to you so you can take a look at it. Yeah, I know well, a lot of Just a tag on to that. Uh, if you go to startnewyard.com uh, and register, you can request a site visit and someone knowledgeable will come out and walk your yard with you and discuss these things, uh, give you access to this uh, guide that is the size of a huge dictionary. <laughs> so that has tremendous information. Yeah, so go to startnewyard.com and, and register and request a site visit. For free. And it's free. For free. Yeah. For free. Yes. Uh, and yes, actually, we're, uh, our, our trees and shrubs come from Majestic Oaks, which is up there near Wisconsin. So Henry, yeah. Yep. Um, uh, Nick Fletcher, who's from Shaker Heights, Ohio, he said he's very impressed by the work you're doing with, um, oops, by the tree canopy. He's wondering if you have a tree nursery, nursery uh, excuse me, within the city that you can grow your own oaks for this work. And of course, I know the Arboretum has a very extensive. Uh, growing they grow their own so i'll let you answer that one yeah so i mean are you are, is are you looking nick for growing your own or you're looking for native locally sourced native native trees and um, he, he can't answer you because okay he, uh, so yeah. i'm going to make an assumption i think what you're asking is is are there locally uh uh, locally sourced, locally grown trees here. We have several nurseries that sell locally sourced, locally grown trees. Um, one would be uh, Possibility Place, another is Majestic Oaks, and another is McHenry County Nursery. Uh, those three nurseries grow all of their product from seed, and it's locally sourced seed so that you can, you can get them uh, grown here. Another source, if you're looking for larger quantities, is the state nursery. And while the oaks that they grow may not be unique to our specific area, they are unique to Illinois, so they're locally sourced seed. Um, and if you are growing or you want them to grow for you, you can provide them locally grown seed and they will grow them for you and sell them back to you at a very reasonable cost. They're like, you know, 40 cents a piece or 50 cents a piece or <laughs> a small oak. So they're very, very reasonable. Well, and tagging on again in the spring, uh, the land and water uh, living lands and water makes mm -hmm. oaks available. Some hickories and uh, plants that we can use in this area makes them available for free, and we will be having those available also. And we'll put that on the on the website. There's an interesting question here. Um, oh wait, where to go? <laughs> oh, am I wasting my time and effort if I gather acorns and hickory nuts? and then stick them in the ground at the prairie edges of forest preserves? Um, no, you're not. Um, although they would probably prefer you didn't do that. <laughs> they're, they're either managing for something along their edge or they're trying to maintain an open prairie or an open savanna. So they'd probably prefer you didn't. They have lots of little volunteer squirrels that are planting acorns all over the place that they're probably already <laughs> dealing with. Um, but you know, I don't think it hurts anything as you're walking along to poke a few acorns in the ground. Some of them take more than a year to, um, for the, the seed to stratify and be able to, to uh, produce. And I'm not a propagator, so I don't remember all the details on it. Um, but uh, I think you'd be better off to, to just take a couple of little acorns on your walk home with you, although don't tell the forest preserve I said that and stick them in your yard, see if you can get them started there. And, and, and give put, it to your and, neighbors. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and put, uh, I think we were watching a Doug Ptolemy uh, presentation. He put put a little fence around it because uh, the, yeah. the critters love those acorns too. They do, so, they do. Um, one of the things that came up, and we've talked about this a lot here at Wild Ones because one of our members has had a lot of problem with herbicide drift. Um, okay. In fact, uh, they're even going to, might even ha hopefully have an ordinance in Kane County that people are using things like dicamba. Um, yeah, like dicamba. At, at the wrong, well, it's never the right time of the year, but using it in the summer time, especially that. Yeah. And so a lot of herbicide drift. And she was wondering if there's anything uh, that could be done to help the elk survive that herbicide drift. 
No, there isn't. I mean, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, I, I'm on the Illinois Forestry Development Council and every single year this comes up as a topic of discussion and it's, and sometimes, you know, even the state will let them herbicide a little bit later because the weather's been not so great, you know, which can further uh, put some of our oaks at risk. It is a chronic problem and I, I don't see any solution in the near future about that. And there's really nothing you can do about it once it gets volatilized um, or it gets into the water system. Uh, it can really severely damage your trees. So I wished I had an answer, a better answer for you. I, I know. Um... Sandy said she has an oak across the street. Will companion plants at my home help? I don't absolutely, know. absolutely. <laughs> You're creating a little oasis along the way for some wildlife to move from place to place. And, and it's important that we do support uh, our native systems, whether they be on our property or somewhere else. So that's, that's absolutely. Um, what one Jill said that some cities provide buckthorn pickup, you know, has anyone thought about trying to get that passed? I mean, it's not a bad idea, but you really have to grind that stuff up to be sure, right? The seed, because the seed. Right, right. Well, so. and there's a company that's making furniture out of buckthorn and they're looking for buckthorn to be oh. able to, and they've been asking for sources to get buckthorn. So, oh, um, if you want to have a neighborhood, uh, buckthorn removal contest and put it out at the curb we can see if we can get them to come pick it up well one other thing about buckthorn because i I'm, i am a steward at one of the forest reserves and buckthorn actually we have mostly honeysuckle but it buckthorn burns really well so we always <laughs> happy to have it in a burn pile because it yeah has a, like oil or something in it that mm -hmm, it really mm -hmm. well, sorry i digress but um, Lydia, Nick, I, sorry i, I, no, I how I, do I, we follow up with the uh, furniture idea and putting it out and letting them come and pick it up. Yeah. If you want to just uh, shoot me an email at okay. lscott.mortonarb.org, I'll be glad to connect you with them. Okay. That's that's great. Uh, I was, oh yeah, so um, Nick wrote back, he was the one I was asking about growing the trees and he just said he was interested about growing, who, who grows oaks for the canopy. Of course, he's in Ohio. So I'm sure that there must be some native nurseries. You know, yeah, uh, if he okay. if he'll contact his state DNR, they'll know who those okay. nurseries are. Okay, and then um, Jill said, "Well, it's not really a question." She said, "We should, oh yeah, stop eating non-organic foods so they'll stop growing things with almost <laughs> good, good good idea." So, um, yeah. so I don't. I'm just looking in the in the chats too. So, oh, he said, "Yeah, Nick said he's looking to grow oaks to be used to repopulate the canopy." So. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you just said that too. So, and uh, but he might want to, uh, Nick, take a look at uh, the Talamy video, which is on our site, the one about oaks, yes. where he talks about uh, planting small and it will uh, outgrow what you plant large. So, mm -hmm. in thinking about what, how big you want them before you actually plant them where they're going to uh, stay, uh, that's an important point in that mm -hmm. video. You know, um, this one person said, and I watched the same presentation from uh, Wild Ones last night. The webinar was about from Neil Dybul from, did I pronounce that correctly, from Wisconsin. And he claimed that many nurseries are not very diverse because some trees grow big and others hardly at all. So they sort of stack the back to, for trees that grow well. And I don't, you know, I don't know if there's any way to really get around that except to go to some place like Possibility Place or uh, Majestic Oak. So. Yeah. Anyway, um, so has there been any work done? Uh, this is in the chat uh, on um, outlawing the sale of Barberry, Bradford pear, burning bush. Well, actually, um, we just got the Illinois Invasive Species Council back up and functioning um, in December of, of December of 2021 was their first meeting, um, and it's been because the Rauner administration eliminated the Invasive Species Council when they came into office, um, they eliminated the funding for it. And so it's just now coming back up and there is a terrestrial plants. They have four taxa. They've got aquatic wild or aquatic life, which includes plants and animals. There's wildlife, there's terrestrial plants and animals, and then there's pests and pathogens. So there's four committees. And so they are the, uh, the terrestrial plants group is starting to look at some of those species. And uh, obviously the state could work to make recommendations prior to that, but there's no pressure on them to do that. And I think with 
this new um, getting the invasive species council up and running again i think it will help get some of this put through that's great okay i don't and nick just put in the chat that it, they are outlaw bradford pears are outlawed in, in ohio at this point Ohio has an exceptional invasive species council. Jennifer Windus, who's the president there, has um, been very helpful here for us. Interesting. Huh. There is, uh, and Jill asked um, if, if the plants from Possibility Plays or Majestic Oaks are diverse, you know, a di diverse species. From origin, yeah. Yeah, they, they work hard to try to make them that way. Um, it, it, it doesn't hurt to ship between Majestic Oaks and Possibility Place just to make sure you're getting a broad uh, mix. Right. So I don't see, I don't think I missed anything, did I? No, I think you've gotten everything. Yeah. Well, this has been great. I, um, I would, I put I, lots of <laughs> maybe you noticed I, my computer crashed and, yeah. I've, and I've managed to crawl back in. But um, I would just ask Kim and Nancy if there's anything else they want to highlight about announcements or upcoming uh, opportunities. Just uh, to just say real quick that we will likely be having one more over our head uh, program on trees, uh, but I don't have details for you tonight. So uh, watch the newsletter and uh, the, uh, the library calendar and our website for the the actual details of what's coming it'll be march or april right okay. and and join us next thursday if you can uh with benjamin vote it'll be a really fascinating nancy has heard him and she said he's just wonderful so i'm looking forward to it he's talking about gardening and layers and he's go to his website monarchgardens.org it's great okay. well a big thank you to lydia scott for generously sharing uh, her time this evening and uh, using her great experience and expertise on this really crucial recovery project. Yes. Thank you all for coming. Thank Stay you. warm. See yes. you for more exciting yes. and informative programs coming your way. Bye-bye. Bye, Thank you, Thank ladies. Bye-bye. Bye, Sadia. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Sadia. Bye.